I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, forest health is a huge topic that has very many different avenues that we could go down. It really does, Renee. It's something that's core to all we do. If we don't have healthy woodlands, we certainly can have productive woodlands and we won't be able to recreate in those woodlands. So the health of our woodlands is one of the most fundamental things that we care about here in forestry and natural resources. So we're really excited today to have Dr. Ellen Crocker. She's going to be talking about some forest health stuff. She's also been leading a forest health conference coming up real soon, too. So we might hear a little more about that. Um, we also have Kai Davis, who's a regular graduate student that's been on the program a number of years, it back as wildlife sounds. So I appreciate Kai for that. And then we've got a, a tree of the week. He's going to be talking about my favorite bird, one of them. Anyway. Uh, okay. I'll look forward to hearing that. So yeah. And then we've got the tree of the week. Um, Laurie Thomas has put together a new tree of the week for us. And then um, I'll save that one until we debut it. But just glad to have you all with us. Um, you can interact with us via the chat pod on Zoom. And if you're on YouTube, thanks for being there with us as well. So um, thank you all. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Ellen? Welcome. Hey everyone, great to be with you today. I know that, uh, you know, some folks are iced in across the state. We have variable conditions in different areas. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about forest health. No surprises there. I, I've done that a time or two on this show, right? Um, but today what I'm going to do is give an overview of kind of what is forest health and what are some of the major issues in the state, um, and also tell you a little bit about the upcoming forest health conference. It's happening next week um, on the UK campus. Oh, sounds great. Looking forward, to it. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Crocker. Oh, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be on the show. Um, so, you know, I, I talk about forest health a lot and in different ways. Forest health means lots of different things. And I think that's one of the most kind of challenging things about it is that it is hard to define exactly what is healthy and what does forest health mean. Now, most of the time when we're talking forest health, we're talking about a balance between uh, woodlands and forests that are growing vigorously, that are sustainable into the future, that are um, doing the things we want them to do from a biodiversity perspective, from a wildlife perspective, but also that they're meeting our management objectives. And different people have different goals for their woods, so it's no surprise that health might look a little bit different depending on what you're interested in. But nonetheless, I think that there are some kind of common characteristics there in terms of when we're talking about what's healthy, a lot of times, in our woods, what are things we're looking for? We're looking for vigorously growing trees. We're looking for a diversity of different trees, of different species, of different shrubs, of different plants, of different wildlife that they're supporting, and that there's the potential for that to continue in the future that you have regeneration of the trees that you want to be seeing. You've got those seedlings that are growing into saplings that are growing into big trees in the future. So if there is some disturbance, um, those stands can recover from that. Uh, now the flip side of that might be a lot of trees that are dying, that are damaged, a lot of invasive species that are preventing those things from happening. And those are some of the common characteristics that I think about in our forest and what to look for. But, you know, if we just think about some different areas and you might be familiar with some spots that look like this picture right here, is this woodland healthy? Is this stand healthy? Well, uh, it's not a trick question. Um, no, it's not looking great. And you, what you're seeing there is lots of dead trees. Now, this is just a snapshot in time. Maybe it's just the winter time, those leaves don't have their trees don't have their leaves on. But what you're seeing there are trees that have been killed by the emerald ash borer. And uh, if you you have a stand like this with lots and lots of trees that have been killed, that to me is a major red flag. Versus if it was just a tree or two that had been killed, that's less of a serious issue long term for the health of your woods. Um, at the same time, let's say that instead of being killed, these trees were trees that have lost their leaves due to some insect that's defoliating. Is that healthy? Well, again, you know, it depends. It depends on what happens from here. Do those trees bounce back from that? Um, or long-term are there gonna be impacts to that? Most of the time the trees would, trees are incredibly resilient. They can bounce back from a lot of different things, um, especially a lot of the native issues you might see pop up. But there are other invasive issues out there that can cause problems. 
Um, how about this stand? Does this look healthy to you? Well, on the one hand, what you're seeing here is um, an area that has been totally overrun by the invasive plant winter creeper. So you can see it's just carpeting the ground there and uh, that evergreen shine leaves are carpeting everything. You don't have a diversity of other things in understory. All you have is winter creeper and then it's growing up into the trees. Now, is that a problem? Um, it depends kind of on what your goals are. It's not a good thing from a biodiversity perspective. All you have is winter creeper in the understory. It's not a good thing from a regeneration perspective. That invasive plant is choking other things out, preventing them from growing there. So maybe, uh, the trees that it's growing up, even if it doesn't really directly impact those, because it doesn't tend to strangle them, it just grows up them, um, it certainly could have an impact long term and what's going to happen in that stand. If you lose those trees that are there, those invasive plants, and this is an example of winter creeper, but there are lots of other ones, they're going to prevent what you want to see happening in your woods. And then this is a different picture. You know, here's an area that has a tree that's tipped up and kind of fallen over. Now, is that healthy? And a lot of times someone might see this and it's not healthy for that individual tree, right? <laughs> that tree is not healthy, but that's different from if that stand is healthy, if that area is healthy, it's totally normal. And in some ways, good to have a dead tree or two in your woods. Um, wildlife use those. And frankly, it's, it's impossible not to have a little bit of that because trees are living creatures. They're gonna grow and, and naturally age and eventually die. but uh, if you're seeing a lot of that, that's a red flag, a cause for concern. If you're just seeing that occasionally, it might not be a big deal. And knowing that difference is really key because one or two dead trees in the woods is not a problem, but a lot of them could be a sign of a more important issue there that's causing that. So in addition to all of this, there are different considerations for different types of stands and different goals. So if you have an area that was recently harvested, what you're really trying to do is see is there regeneration happening that's going to be the next generation of those trees and if not what needs to be done to get that happening is it that there's a lot of invasive plants everywhere that's preventing that is it that there's too much deer browse and ideally doing that on the front end so that you're set up for success on the other hand if you've got a lot of large trees and you have no plans for a harvest you still might get a disturbance that comes in and impact things but what you're thinking about is going to be a little bit different because you might be most interested in the health of those large trees, those dominant trees. What's going on with them? Are there things that are impacting them as well as thinking diversity for the long term? Um, so there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to uh, forest health or what you might want to do. There's no single prescription out there because everyone's stands are different and every woodland is a little bit different. Um, so it just depends. It depends on what you want. Now, there are, however, a few kind of major forest health threats across the state that I think it's worthwhile to be aware of, because if you don't know about them, you can't be working to manage them or stop them. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's not a lot we can do about these things that are headed our way, but there's a lot you can do in how we respond to them to set your woods up for success long term. So these might be things like invasive insects and diseases. Um, these two pictures show two different invasive insects that have caused major problems in our state. And I'll talk a little bit more about one of them, the emerald ash borer. But um, this other one is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And both of those are invasive. They're from somewhere else in the world. And when they came here, uh, our trees don't really have defenses for them and they're they're killing them off. Now we can't necessarily stop them in their tracks. Uh, there, That cat is out of the bag here, but there's a lot we can be doing to maybe protect individual trees or to think about what impact is this gonna have on your woods? And then how can you be managing to offset that long-term? Invasive plants are another one. And I showed that picture with winter creeper, but here's a picture of bush honeysuckle, another invasive plant that really takes over in our understories. And you can see just how dense it is. This is really early spring. So it leaves out one of the first things to leaf out. And it just forms this dense blanket that other things aren't gonna get through. It's gonna decrease diversity of stands. It's gonna inhibit that regeneration that we wanna be seeing naturally. Um, these invasive plants, in some cases, they can impact the health of an individual tree, but a lot of times they're changing things kind of more fundamentally in our stands. 
Um, there's also a legacy of past management. So if you've got something like uh, a stand that has been uh, overgrown uh, in the case of some of our pines in the state, we've got um, pine stands that should have been thinned a while ago and weren't, um, and they're declining. That's something that's really uh, impacted by what happened in the past. The same thing with some of the harvesting practices. If you have a stand that was high graded, um, that could impact your health going forward. And then I did wanna mention extreme weather because we know we've had some extreme weather events, uh, whether it's a tornado like in this picture here or flooding or other things that have been happening across the state really impacting not just our trees, but a lot of different things. And kind of thinking about what impact that's going to have long term. And there are a lot of other things. Um, a lot of the other things that you might see popping up on your trees um, might look bad, but long term are less likely to be a major issue for the health of your tree. I'm thinking about all of the different foliar issues that, um, you know, the tree might have some leaves that don't look so great. Uh, and the truth is our trees, they host a lot of different insects and sometimes those insects feed on them. But a lot of those, especially those native issues, uh, those are things that our trees have dealt with for a long time. And some years might be worse and some years might be better, but they're unlikely to drive things in the same way that the invasive insects, diseases and plants, the legacy of past management and these extreme weather events are. Um, so, Let's talk about one of those, and that's the emerald ash borer, because that's such a big issue in our state. Um, that's an invasive insect. Here you can see this metallic green beetle um, whose larvae tunnel under the bark of trees right in the vascular system of ash trees specifically. They are really damaging to white and green ash especially, which are the most common ash trees in our state. Across the state, it was about 4% of the trees before the emerald ash borer arrived, a little bit less now. Um, but then that tunneling will be enough to damage the tree and kill it. And here's a map of where emerald ash borer is currently known to occur in Kentucky. Uh, what you can take away from this map is that it's pretty much the whole state. It's moving into the western part of the state right now. Um, and I think what's worth noting about this is that where you are in the state is going to mean different things. It's if you're in this northern or central part of Kentucky, you're talking about dealing with a legacy of having lost ash. So you've lost a lot of trees that used to be dominant. You might have invasive species popping up everywhere. Um, you know, do you have other species filling those gaps or not? Versus if you're in this part of the state, in the western part, you can expect to see emerald ash borer headed your way soon. Um, and you've got more options there to, right now. Uh, if you have a lot of ash, it could be worth considering if you want to have a harvest preemptively, knowing you're going to lose those trees anyways, to give you some funds to offset other management. Because what we've seen a lot of is that um, once the trees start going downhill, uh, they become really dangerous. Uh, and that's a problem, you know, both for you getting in your woods, but also the quality decreases really rapidly. So if you want to do something about it, do it early on. And you want to manage those invasive plants early on because emerald ash borer is its own problem, but it can certainly make the invasive plant problem worse. Um, and so, you know, if you're in those parts of the state, what you might look for are these dead branches, thinning crown, maybe insect holes and tree. And here's that tunneling that I told you about happening under the bark of that larva, the emerald ash borer larva. But many other places are just seeing dead trees with lots of bark flaking off or uh, a lot of trees that have snapped in half that have died and are a hazard um, and are kind of changing our stands, changing our woodlands. Uh, really deeply because if you had just an ash tree or two it's no big deal um, your woods can probably tolerate that just fine but if you had a lot of them uh, that might need some more active management from you to set the stage for what you want long term and so what to do now it really depends it depends on the scenario you're talking about how much ash were there to begin with um, 
you know, in a landscape setting, and there were a lot of ash trees that were planted in urban landscapes, um, there are some great treatment options, insecticide treatment options for ash trees that can protect them from the emerald ash borer. And you could certainly do that in your woodland setting too. But uh, realistically, the costs associated with that, while a great idea for landscape trees, may not be feasible on a, long, a large scale in your woods, especially because this is something that's going to have to be repeated over time. Um, on the flip side, thinking about, you know, what is it going to mean uh, when that ash is gone or, or now that it has gone? Are you seeing the species that you want filling in those gaps? Or is it a bunch of ash regeneration, which is very common because the seedlings that are coming up from those ash species, they might grow fine for a little while until they're killed by that emerald ash borer again. Um, so thinking about that long term, how do we deal with that forest health threat? I think laying the foundation for success post emerald ash borer is definitely something that woodland owners can be thinking about and working with professionals on because while emerald ash borer, and I'm just giving this as one example of a forest health threat is bad, uh, you can set the stage for a bright future. And we're fortunate to be in an area here in Kentucky where we grow trees really well. And there are lots of um, other great species that if we can uh, encourage their growth and encourage them to fill in some of those gaps left by ash, um, that's a real positive. So just one example with that emerald ash borer, but we could talk hemlock, woolly adelgid and other invasive insects and diseases, but I wanna, give a little bit of time for invasive plants as well, because that's another major forest health threat. And there are lots of them out there. So what do we mean by invasive? We mean that it's not from here, it causes problems and it can take over. And that's important with our plants because we saw with the uh, winter creeper and with the bush honeysuckle just taking over in that understory. It's not from here, it's from some other part of the world. And there maybe it's a good player and it's, kind of more imbalanced with some of the other plants that it naturally interacts with. But here, it, they seem to be able to take off and form these really dense stands. And these are just examples of a couple different invasive plants. They're both pretty, but they can really dominate and prevent a diversity of species you want to be seeing. So why are they a problem in our woods? Well, first, they get in the way of your goals. Um, you can't be doing some of the things that you want to be doing if you have a sea of invasive plants taking over. So, for example, if you had a harvest and you've got a sea of microstegium or stilt grass that has taken over after that, you're not going to be seeing the growth that you want to down the road. It could really set you back in your plans. They also decrease biodiversity, whether that's of plants or of the things that depend on the plants, the insects and the wildlife from there. Um, if you just have a sea of bush honeysuckle, maybe some of those animals like bush honeysuckle and are going to thrive, but certainly not the diversity you could get otherwise. And then some of these can actually change these systems to their benefit. I mentioned that with the arrival of emerald ash borer, we've seen more invasive plants there. So once you get one invasive species, it's, it seems to be easier and easier for more invasive species to arrive. Um, and they can really take advantage of disturbances, uh, whether they're natural, um, like a tornado, or, or things that we've done, like a harvest. Or in this case, you know, something that is growing alongside a trail. This is vinca, which is a common ornamental plant, beautiful in its uh, ornamental setting, a uh, really nice ground cover, but it doesn't stay put. And it will take advantage if the opportunity presents itself and become a problem. There are lots of different invasive plants out there. We could talk about invasive trees that compete with our native species for sunlight and can grow faster than they can outcompete them. Things like tree of heaven, princess tree or polonia, or increasingly in central and northern Kentucky, calory pear, which is taking over a lot of old field sites. And here you can see it um, probably in next month, it'll look just like this, where all the old fields that you thought oh, this is growing up nicely into, uh, you know, some nice woods. Actually, it's just a sea of calorie pear. Uh, these trees that are growing so densely that nothing else is really underneath and preventing the growth of other species that you want to see. We could talk invasive shrubs that are blanketing the understory, uh, really keeping sunlight from getting down there 
and inhibiting a diversity of species, things like multiflora rose, autumn olive, or bush honeysuckle. We could talk invasive vines that can grow over areas and smother vegetation. Um, sometimes they can even grow up into trees and increase the likelihood that those trees um, are uh, impacted by wind. Um, things like kudzu we've all heard of. I mentioned winter creeper earlier and Japanese honeysuckle, but there are many more. There are many more of all of these. There are uh, invasive spring ephemerals, invasive grasses, and other invasive uh, herbaceous plants. Um, and really, I think the most effective way to manage invasive plants is to keep them from arriving to begin with. If you can keep them from being the problem in your woods, that's the goal, right? But for most landowners, it's not that. It's playing catch up. You've noticed you have a problem. Maybe you already have tons of honeysuckle in your woods. What do you do about that? I think it's really important to prioritize, to think about what are your goals? What's getting in the way of those goals? In this case, you know, maybe the honeysuckle is not impacting these big trees, but if you were to have some disturbance in there, you wouldn't have the, the growth that you want to be seeing. The, advanced regeneration or the seedlings, the saplings that are there ready to go because you've got that there. Um, then what are your resources? Um, I've heard uh, from a lot of different folks that a really good way to think about invasive plant management would be to start small and start with a good area, an area that you just want to make better. Um, and then work out from there instead of trying to go to the very worst or the worst spots where you can spend a lot of effort and a lot of time and not have as big of an impact, do what you can accomplish each year in a sustainable way. Because invasive plant management is something you need to plan for sustained and long-term over time. Uh, you can do a lot in one year, but then if you wait a few years, those invasive plants, they are so tenacious and they grow so fast um, that it's really gotta be something that you can maintain over time. So let's just give one example. I've mentioned bush honeysuckle already. What do you do? You've got a sea of it in your woods, welcome to the club, right? <laughs> you have, you've got lots of folks who are in your shoes as well. How do you manage it? It depends, it depends on what you've got there, the size of the plants, the infestation, what else is growing around, making sure you wanna keep the good stuff and get rid of the things that you don't want. Do you have small trees of bush honeysuckle like in this picture? Do you have a lot of smaller stuff? That all depends. One thing I would emphasize is that with bush honeysuckle or a lot of our woody species, any control you do must control the roots. Otherwise it will re-sprout vigorously. And that's important to think about because you know you might be tempted to do some management options, but you can spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and not get a lot of results. And that's not what we want, right? We wanna maximize our effort. So Again, let's think about bush honeysuckle. If you just had a few smaller plants, like in this picture here, or just smaller plants, you can certainly mechanically remove those. You could hand pull those. Um, they even sell different devices for slightly larger plants that you can kind of pop them out of the ground. Um, you can, as long as you're getting the roots out of there, you can definitely do that. Um, you could also do a foliar herbicide spray of that smaller stuff. Um, it's really a great time to do that is late in the year in the fall because what bush honeysuckle keeps its leaves much longer than most of our natives do. So while everything else has lost its leaves, bush honeysuckle still has its leaves on, you can really target what you're doing to that invasive plant you don't want and save all of the things you do want to keep. And so that's, you know, a, a good thing. But let's say you've got bigger plants. What are some options there? Again, you need to kill that root system. So one really commonly used approach with bush honeysuckle is called a cut stump herbicide treatment. Like right here, you can see this person uh, cutting the stems and then spraying the herbicide on those cut stems. Um, that's a good way to really target your treatment just to that plant. You don't use much herbicide um, and you can target it to the root system of the honeysuckle you want to get rid of. There are lots and lots of other approaches though, and that's just scratching the surface. So, you know, that's another thing I wanna emphasize is that do your research when you're dealing with something new. Uh, don't just use what you already have sitting around. There are some different approaches that are gonna be more effective for some things and less for others. So no matter what you're doing with invasive plants, you've got a plan for continued monitoring and removal. You want diversity. You don't just want no invasives, right? So you want to plan for that. And this is just a success story picture. Where you can see a sea of winter creeper right over here. 
And then where it's been removed, you've got beautiful trilliums coming up just the next year that we're just waiting for that winter creeper to be gone. And you can just see a huge impact. Um, so that's just a little bit on uh, some of the key forest health threats in our state. But the best thing you can do if you're dealing with issues is to reach out to some of the resources. So that could be your county agents. Every single county in the state of Kentucky has a county office with fabulous agents who can help you if you have questions. You can also, of course, reach out to extension specialists like myself, like Billy, uh, like Jonathan Larson and entomology and others. Um, and then the Kentucky Division of Forestry is a wonderful resource, both their service foresters, but also uh, their forest health coordinator, someone like Alexandra Blevins right here, who deals with these forest health issues on a regular basis and can also talk with you about what's happening in your woods. There are also consulting foresters, other technical service providers who can accomplish some of the things that might need to get done in your woods, like invasive plant management. Um, there are cost share funding opportunities through NRCS that might be an option for you if you're trying to deal with invasive plant management or other forest health issues. And then I also wanted to mention the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They've got other great things going on. So all of these resources might look at it from a slightly different perspective, but have a lot of good information for you about uh, the health of your woods and what you can be doing to promote it. So with that, I wanna wrap things up, but I also wanna invite all of you to, if you wanna learn more about forest health, uh, what are some of those threats out there, but also what's being done to manage them, to come to our Kentucky Forest Health Conference next Wednesday, February 8th. Um, if you scan this QR code, it'll take you to the registration link. Um, and we've got speakers coming from across the region and beyond to talk about different things like, oh, hemlock will you delge it? I mentioned that earlier, an invasive insect that's killing our hemlocks. There's exciting research being done to try to fight that insect. So you'll hear about that. You'll hear about different threats that are out there and how people are managing those. So I hope to see you then. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll stop my share and see if we have any questions. Well, thank you, Ellen. We greatly appreciate that. Um, it was a great presentation. And we do have one question is, is there a native plant that looks similar to autumn olive? That's a good question. Um, there are other invasive plants that look similar to autumn olive. There's Russian olive, uh, which you know can make you do a double take and kind of uh, look at it sideways. Um, but mostly what I see is autumn olive. Um, do other people know of native plants that look like autumn olive? I think it really stands out with the silvery undersides of the leaves. Um, now, that that is maybe in the eye of the beholder, uh, but I think um, the dense form, the silvery, silvery nature of the underside of the leaves uh, really stick out. Um, and then we had a question about butternut. Um, butternut canker is one of the topics that we'll cover at this conference. Um, you, you might have heard of butternut or white walnut. Uh, it's a species that is beloved by those who know it, but is rare and it seems to be increasingly rare. And if you've thought to yourself, oh, I haven't seen any butternut or white walnut around, the reason for that is probably this invasive pathogen that's been wiping it out, butternut canker. Um, exciting news is that the Forest Service has kind of picked up a breeding program to try to identify butternut that has some defenses to this issue and then get them back out on the landscape. And so they do have some efforts looking for those trees that are still around. If you have a tree that a butternut that's around, you can report it on the Tree Snap app, and you might be asked to send some uh, seeds, send some nuts to their program. Um, but you can learn more about that uh, at our conference next week. I feel Hopefully, like it will make a comeback. I want it to make a comeback. Okay. <laughs> I feel like a lot of the trees you talk about, they're like, well, this one's dying. And that one's, I was like, oh no, is there a tree that's not so, getting? <laughs> I'll say this it's easy to be doom and gloom with forest health, right? Because it's true. Um, there are new insects and pathogens, it seems like every day that can attack the uh, native trees that we hold dear. Um, but our trees are incredible. They are very resi resilient and our woodlands are resilient. And so I think that actually there's, there's a lot of success stories with how we 
have been working, um, you know, researching different ways to protect them. Um, and I also think that we're in a great place for forest health. Um, Kentucky, we can grow trees really well. Uh, so that's another really positive thing for us. We have diversity of tree species. Um, and it gives us a lot of buffer room from a forest health perspective. Somebody just made a comment that their forest in Western Kentucky is widespread, still susceptible to EAB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's why I wanted to share that map, because I think uh, uh, folks out West have this kind of false sense of security with EAB emerald ash borer, because it's been in Kentucky for since 2009, you know, everywhere else, all of their trees have already died. Um, but unfortunately, it's not that there's something special about that region or those trees necessarily. It's just that that invasive beetle has not made its way to you yet. Um, now, there are some different kind of patterns in the landscape out there that can, I think, explain for part of why it hasn't spread through there as rapidly as it has some other regions. And who knows, you know, we'll see what the future has in store. I would love it if that area was just less impacted, but most likely what's gonna happen is you're gonna see emerald ash borer come through there in the next five years. It might already be there right now. We don't know about it. It's pretty much surrounded that region. It's further south and further north. Um, so it's probably just a matter of time. The bright side of that is that you know it's coming. So you know it's gonna be there. So you can plan ahead a little bit um, versus I think some other areas that you know, weren't prepared for its arrival. It kind of took them by surprise. Um, being ready for it lets you do things like uh, plan a harvest preemptively if that's of interest and makes sense for you, um, to manage invasive plants before it gets there and they become more problematic um, and more. Well, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, Ellen. We greatly appreciate it. And if anybody wants to uh, sign up for that conference, um, I'm sure Ellen will put the uh, link in the chat pod so you can sign up. I will. And we just scratched the surface today, right? right. Um, we just talked about a couple little things. Um, but I really encourage you, you know, if you're the, the whoever commented that their woods are in Western Kentucky, they're trying to figure out what to do reach out to some of those resources, reach out to the Kentucky Division of Forestry, um, talk with them about some of your options, because it's going to depend, and each, each location is a little bit different, but there are some fantastic resources across the state to help you. Right. Well, thanks again, Ellen. Thanks. So, Billy. She does such a good job. She does. It's amazing, you know, but yeah. she has such a broad coverage of topics that she talks about. With uh, and it's such important a, a topic for all of us. It really is. So it big really thanks is. to Dr. Crocker for that. Um, yeah. And, and reach out to those professionals, right? You don't have to know all this stuff by yourself. So there's a lot of support out there and um, Dr. Crocker covered many of them. So please take advantage of those. Um, and if you don't know where to start, you can start with us or your local county extension offices for sure. But Yep. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to keep the show going, talking about ash a little bit more. Laurie Thomas was able to do a tree of the week for us, and it is one of our ash trees. It's one of our native ash trees we have here. It certainly is um, a, a threatened by EAB. Um, I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, but she's done a great job with this. So let's go ahead and roll that video. Okay, that'd be great. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the green ash. Green ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica, is the most widely distributed ash in North America. It is a member of the Oleaceae, or olive family, which is made up of about 500 to 600 species of trees and shrubs. The two genera, Fraxinus and Olea, are noted for their fine timber that they produce. Green ash is also known as red ash, swamp ash, and water ash, and it can be confused with white, black, and pumpkin ash in the field. It is a medium-sized deciduous tree that typically has a rounded to slightly irregular crown. Trees usually grow 50 to 70 feet tall and up to 24 inches in diameter, but on good sites in the southern part of their range, they can grow up to 120 feet tall and up to 30 inches in diameter. It is a moderately fast-growing tree with an attractive form and it is tolerant of an array of sites. This tolerance has led to it being popular as an urban shade tree or ornamental. However, with the introduction of the emerald ash borer, which has affected the ashes throughout their range, most ash species are no longer recommended for landscape planting. 
The wood is durable and similar to white ash, and it's an important wildlife tree both as a larval host and for its large seed crops. Green ash is found from Nova Scotia to Alberta, Canada, west to Montana and Wyoming, and south to Texas and Florida. It is found throughout Kentucky, but it's not as common as white ash. Green ash grows best on fertile, moist, well-drained soils, but it can also grow in a range of sites from clay to sandy soils with varying degrees of moisture. It is considered a bottomland species that is found growing with sweet gum, cottonwood, willows, red maple, and bottomland oaks and hickories. It is one of the most adaptable of all the ashes and it can grow on a range of sites. Green ash is considered intermediate in shade tolerance. Green ash is a deciduous tree with oppositely arranged pinnately compound leaves. It is one of the four groups of trees in Kentucky that has oppositely arranged leaves, the maples, ashes, dogwoods, and buckeyes. So if you can remember the mnemonic Mad Buck, then you can remember the tree with the trees with oppositely arranged leaves in Kentucky. The leaves are usually six to nine inches long and composed of seven to nine serrated lance-shaped leaflets. The leaflets are green above and glabrous to silky pubescent below. Autumn color is typically yellow and most attractive. This species is typically dioecious with male flowers and female flowers on separate trees. The male flowers are in tight clusters and the female flowers are in loose panicles and both tend to be a light purple in color. The flowers bloom as the leaves unfold in spring and the flowers are wind pollinated. And trees usually begin flower production when the trees reach 3 to 4 inches in diameter and up to about 20 to 25 feet tall. The fruit of green ash is a single winged Samara. The Samara is flat with a slender, thin seed cavity. The Samaras are born in clusters. The fruit ripens in the fall and will generally drop as soon as they ripen. Most of the seeds are wind dispersed, but some may also be dispersed by water. The seeds will germinate in the following spring, or they may lie dormant in the leaf litter for several years. Many ash trees are known for exhibiting masting behavior, where they produce very abundant seed crops every five years, while others produce good seed crops every year. Green, also, green ash also regenerates from stump sprouts. The bark is gray to brown in color and has ridges that interlace to form diamonds. On older trees, the bark may become somewhat scaly. The bark looks similar to white ash, but the furrows are not as deep. The wood of green ash is hard, strong, and has excellent shock resistance. The heartwood is light to medium brown in color, and the sapwood can be very wide and tends to be beige or light brown. And there's not always a clear or sharp demarcation between the heartwood and sapwood. The wood is rated as perishable in regards to decay, and it's not resistant to insect attack. Because the wood is hard and has excellent shock resistance, it's commonly used for tool handles, particularly shovels and hammers. The wood is also used for furniture, flooring, and cabinetry. Ash trees, including green ash, are an important wildlife tree, particularly in the northern Great Plains. They provide food and cover for a variety of birds such as wood duck, sharp-tailed grouse, bobwhite, turkey, blackbirds, finches, grosbeaks, flycatchers, warblers, and cardinals. This species is also very beneficial for mammals, including cottontail rabbits, white-tailed jackrabbits, deer, American beaver, and bison. Green ash is also the larval host for the tiger swallowtail, ash, waves, sphinx, sphinx mosses, and the polyphemus moth. One of the most destructive insect pests of ash is the emerald ash borer, or EAB. This in invasive insect pest has caused great mortality in North America to our ash trees. It was introduced from Asia and was first detected in North America in Michigan around 2002. By 2009, it was detected in Kentucky and has since then continued to spread across the state. The national champion green ash as of 2022 is in Hartford, Connecticut, and it's 245 inches in circumference, 82 feet tall, with a 90-foot crown spread. And as of 2022, there is currently not a champion green ash in Kentucky. If you'd like to know more about um, champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees, or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about green ash. Green ash is one of the five Fraxinus species found in Kentucky, according to Wharton and Barber. 
Many wooden canoe paddles and oars are made from green ash wood. The wood was used to, for split rail fencing and for stoking wood burning engines all along the Mississippi Valley. The scientific genus named Fraxinus is from the Latin name for the ash tree and Pennsylvanica means from Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining me to learn about this native ash and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park and neighborhood and enjoy the green ash. Well, you know, Lori, we always greatly appreciate her doing those. Um, and, you know, this might be a question that I'm, I would have for Ellen. Um, I was wondering, is there any ash that's not affected by EAB? Well, so that's a good question because in our state, we have white ash, green ash, and blue ash. So depending on where you're watching from, you might have some different ash species. But in general, our North American ash species are impacted by emerald ash borer. But in our state, the two that are most impacted are white and green ash. Blue ash, for a variety of reasons, is less attractive to the beetle, less of a good host for it. Um, it might still experience some damage, but less than white and green ash, which has just been wiped out. Um, you know, there are ash species in Asia where this beetle is from that also, you know, can tolerate it much better. Um, so it's not like it's just a silver bullet death beetle. Um, it's that our ash have not dealt with it before. Um, now there is some really exciting work being done by the Forest Service and others to try to find any trees that are out there that seem to have some resistance to the beetle that either are not attractive to it, you know, it can't develop in it for whatever reason, haven't been killed by it, and then put them in a breeding program that you can get them back out into the landscape. And so they started with green ash and they have some exciting preliminary results in terms of some trees that seem like they do a pretty good job uh, with that. Now, what's the timeline for getting that back out? You know, making sure that that holds up. There's still a lot more research to do, but it's really exciting the work that they've been doing. And I also wanna give a shout out to the Kentucky Division of Forestry because they've also um, been on the lookout for trees that are still around. So if you're in an area where all of your ash trees were killed by the emerald ash borer several years ago, 95% have been dead for two years, and you still have some that like big trees, not the little little ones that are just growing because those are probably gonna die when they get big enough, but you have big trees that made it through that initial round and you didn't treat them with anything. Those are really of interest. And so if you've got those, um, I know that the division is leading some collection of seeds from trees like that to try to get them back out on the landscape. Uh, so if you've got questions, make sure to reach out to them and maybe you could be part of the future of ASH. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Ellen. Yeah, that's helpful. Definitely, definitely. That's what I'm telling you. It's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Right. That's oh. always helpful. Thank you, Ellen. Yes, yes, yeah. All right. I appreciate that. So now we have Kai Davis, who is Yay! on talking about some wildlife sounds. And Kai, you're actually going to be talking about my favorite bird. So this is awesome. I'm okay. Excited. Cool. Welcome, Kai. No spoilers, Kai. though. No spoilers. <laughs> I'm not um, okay. I'm, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kai, so it's nice to be back on here. It's been a while. Um, and I'm doing some uh, bird calls and bird sounds for us. Uh, so every time I come on, I try to do a theme of a color of, of a bird. So I do one that's a local bird that you should find here throughout the, the year. And then there's another one that I do that's more migratory that you'll find based on the season that we're in. So obviously we're in February. Um, now that it's the first, and I chose uh, the color black. So some birds that we don't necessarily think about a lot. And uh, well, obviously I have Renee's favorite, which is really cool. I'm interested to see what her favorite is too between the two birds. Um, but also I chose this color black because it's now Black History Month. So I wanted to celebrate in that way. So anyway, uh, let's dive into the bird calls. So the first one's gonna be the local bird and I'll show the habitat that you'll find it in. There we go, get my birds flying around. So I'll show the habitat that you'll find it in and I'll play the sound for you. So feel free to guess in the chat if you think you know what it is or you can keep it in your brain and you can claim that you knew it all along, I'll choose to believe you. But yeah, we'll go ahead and dive in. So local.
Okay, so like I said, this is typically the habitat that you would find this in, but it's a local bird and it's really common. So it could be in a lot of different habitats around here. But yeah, this is going to be the habitat. And I'll play it again for you one more time. All right, so if you got your guesses, get them in now. Um, so it is the red winged blackbird. So a very distinct call, it's like a okali or a conklali call. So like you can pick that up and if it's calling, you'll pretty much be like, oh yeah, that's a red winged blackbird. Um, so yeah, let's learn some more about this cool bird. So um, within their life history and behavior, they're one of the most abundant birds in North America, like I said. Uh, they have that really vibrant shoulder patch, that scarlet kind of yellow and red uh, shoulder patch that the males will puff up depending on how confident they feel. Uh, so that's kind of cool and kind of fun to see that, uh, see how confident they might feel. And obviously in breeding season, it might be a little bit more robust and apparent for us. Um, so talking about the males specifically, they're highly polygonous. Uh, they have up to 15 mates uh, and very territorial. Um, ironically enough, with them being highly polygonous and very territorial, uh, some of the offsprings in a territory aren't necessarily sired by the ter uh, terrestrial male. So some other males are coming in and um, producing offspring in that territory, which is really interesting. Uh, so with them being so territorial, they often go after crows and hawks to defend themselves, but even horses and sometimes even people. So watch out. But typically in an urban setting, you won't necessarily get them going after people. They're used to people. Um, but this isn't just exclusive to males, too, at times. Uh, so females can be awfully territorial as well. Um, and I'll show a picture of a female because they look a little bit different. Uh, so this is going to be a female red-winged blackbird. Uh, so as you can see, they're not necessarily black. They kind of have that white streak on their chest and on their face, uh, and they're more dark brown. Uh, they still kind of have that red patch on their shoulder, but it's much more subdued. And in some females, you might not see the uh, red patch at all. They could just look like another sparrow. Uh, so it's kind of hard to identify the females, too, which... Um, you might not think that you have seen a red-winged blackbird before, but like I said, they're pretty common. So you may have just seen it in the distance and may not have thought anything of it. Um, it they're not a very like exciting bird, depending on who you ask and in comparison to others, but I would beg to differ, especially with that red patch. So going forward, um, despite being so territorial, um, the, these red-winged blackbirds, they um, nest in loose groups because the territory that they use, and I'll talk more about the habitat that they like, are uh, very scarce. They're, they like more of a marshy habitat, so that's kind of scarce um, throughout the, the U.S. And in the fall and winter, uh, the, you can see the flocks with many other blackbirds and grackles and cowbirds and starlings, so they're all mixing together and flying around, and they can be a flock up to thousands or millions even, uh, so that's quite interesting. So moving forward into their diet, they eat mostly insects in the summer um, and then more seeds in the winter. So majority of the annual uh, diet is gonna be three-fourths uh, seeds, but they do eat some uh, berries and other fruits as well. In terms of their habitat and location, like I said, they're pretty much found throughout uh, North America and the US specifically. Um, but um, where they're standing water and vegetation, that's primarily where you're likely going, going to find them. They're pretty common there from coast to coast. Uh, breeding season, they like wet places like freshwater marshes, wetland areas, uh, but and stream bed and lakeside areas, waterways within wooded areas. But you can also find them breeding in drier places like sedge meadows and, um, and alfalfa fields and things like that. In the fall and the winter, though, uh, they tend to congregate in the agricultural fields, feedlots, pastures, and grasslands. Uh, easier to find their food that they would eat in that in those areas. Um, so, diving into the conservation and threats uh, for this species, uh, they are one of the most abundant birds, like I said, but they are still suffering from a bit of um, decline. So, about 0.2 percent decline per year between uh, 1966 to 2019. So that results in a cumulative estimated uh, decline of about 28%. Uh, but they're still a species of low conservation concern. Like I said, really abundant. Uh, so urbanization is taking a lot of their habitat, which plays into the conservation. Also, spring heat waves threaten their, their young. 
So that's kind of what the threats that we see uh, for their conservation. And then some fun facts for this bird. They are a sign of transformation and change. They're all, they also represent the power of love and compassion, which is fitting for February and Valentine's Day. Uh, and they're a symbol for a spiritual growth, inner strength, courage, determination, and self-awareness. So I guess with such a common bird, a lot of people have ass assigned many symbols and signs to this bird. So they're all positive, which is good. They're not like an omen bird. So if you see these, uh, you should rejoice because it's, it's bringing good, good things. Um, so now we'll dive into our migratory bird um, and look at the habitat and listen to what they are. All right. Maybe if this one wants to cooperate. There we go. All right, so for this one, it's kind of that ringing metallic trill that's all on the same pitch, and it's like a car alarm, people will say. Again, if you think you know it, feel free to put it out there, um, and I'll play it again for you one more time. All right, so last second, get them in, and I will reveal it is the dark eyed Junko. Uh, so there are some cute little birds. I'll play the sound for you all again. Again, it's that ringing metallic trill all on the same pitch for the most part, and then it's like a car alarm. All right, so let's learn some more about this cute little bird. So, um, the dark-eyed junco is one of the most common and abundant forest birds in North America. They can be found throughout uh, the continent from Alaska to Mexico and from California to New York. So pretty much all over. Um, and it was, it's quite interesting too. So east of the Plains states uh, in the Plains area, the juncos kind of look like this picture. So this, I wanted to show a representation of what you would find here in Kentucky. So they would kind of look like this, uh, that black gray uh, top, or, and then that white bottom for the most part. And then that the black and gray can vary on how much it covers the body too. Um, but in the West, West of the Plains, you find a different and more variety of color patterns. You have like a reddish brown on the back or on the underbelly or some pink on the sides and some yellow. So it's kind of cool to see the variation in their color and the coloration uh, based on where they are regionally. Um, so when they're foraging, they typically hop on the ground like this one is. They scratch at leaf litter and flip very low in the underbrush. Sometimes they'll fly up and catch uh, insects from the ground. Um, the males will court the females. They'll fan or flick their tails and their wings. They'll hop around and up and down. They'll pick up pieces of nest material and rub them around and try to show off for the females. Uh, the females typically prefer males that show more white in the tail too. Um, so it's kind of that. Uh, selection pressure in that aspect. Uh, juncos will typically um, have like a hierarchy or a pecking order, pun intended, uh, based on arrival. So those that migrate to an area first will typically have higher uh, ranking in the hierarchy than others. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, uh, their hierarchy system that they might have. So diving into the diet, they're primarily seed eaters and makes up about 75% of their yearly diet. Um, at feeders, if you're trying to attract these cute little birds. So if this one is Renee's favorite tip, they do prefer millet and uh, sunflower seeds. So if you want to attract them, uh, you can find them there. But they will typically eat under the bird feeder, not necessarily on the bird feeder. Um, so during breed breeding season, they also eat insects and they actually feed their young, mostly insects. Uh, and they eat some berries too. So their habitat, um, they're mostly found in coniferous forests, but they can also be found in deciduous forests. During the winter and uh, on migration, they use a wider variety of habitats. Uh, they're less picky with their habitats. Uh, open woodlands, fields, roadsides, parks, uh, gardens, pretty much all over uh, throughout the city and things like that in their migration. And like I said, less picky. And I actually saw a uh, dark-eyed junco for the first time on campus, right uh, close to our building at forestry. So that's part of why I chose this bird. Um, so then diving into their migration, uh, they move, they winter down in uh, the lower 48 for the most part, and then even down in um, Mexico. Uh, so you will find them in, here in Kentucky around this time in the winter time. So they move down uh, around September to December and they winter here and they move back up or west in around March to May. 
So that's when they'll move out. Um, but in Appalachia, so we can see this little streak right here in Appalachia, uh, they actually move just to higher elevations. They're a colder climate bird, so they'll just move to higher elevations as opposed to moving uh, north or west. Um, and then uh, the different forms can actually meet up in the summer out west or up north. So like the different coloration forms, they'll actually meet up. So that's kind of cool. And interestingly enough, uh, all the birds I've talked about before, they typically migrate south from here, but this bird will migrate north or west. So it's kind of different looking at the migration of this bird. So diving into the conservation and threats, uh, populations have declined about 0.7% per year uh, from 1966 to 2019. It's about a 31% decline total. Uh, estimated global breeding population is about 220 million. Uh, low conservation concern, again, they're really abundant throughout North America. However, wildfires and spring heat waves are going to be their biggest threats. So lastly, with fun facts, I feel like I shared a bunch of little fun facts about this bird. But lastly, they're known as snowbirds. Uh, so they're commonly seen in snow throughout uh, the lower 48 for the most part, especially in this region. Uh, and they're thought to bring the snowy weather with them. But it's really just because they tend to reappear in the winter time because they migrate here during those times. But yeah, so that is everything about the right winged blackbird and the dark eyed junco. So uh, thank you. And I will see you next time. Yeah, it was the red winged blackbird is the one. I like. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Fond memories of going to the lake and hearing that bird. So that was that was the Aww. reason. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're going to be really apparent in those areas for sure. Right, definitely. Now we know. Right. The, the That's real good stuff, Kai. Thanks, Kai. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, those are always fun segments. Yeah, I, I was sitting here and, um, you know, I actually want to give a quick shout out to the Whitley County Extension Office, who is hosting Ellen and I as we're traveling today. This is the first time, Renee, we've been a, at a county extension office, you know, to do part of the show. And, um, you know, it's a good reminder that all of our county extension offices are out there for everybody, right? We've got a lot of great agents and staff across the state to help folks. So, if you don't know where to go on anything forestry and natural resources, you can start with them. But uh, yeah, Kai, I really appreciate that. It was a great segment. I love those. Those are so interesting. I'm sitting here trying to guess. Um, and Ellen, <laughs> I'll have to give her a shout out. She did get the Junko, um, but uh, I did not. So um, we'll give her a big credit for that. So Kai, you'll be proud of um, Dr. Crocker on that one. Um, all right. Well, you know, we are done for today, but we greatly appreciate you joining us each and every week. Um, each week we do this. So you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and see all of our past shows or uh, to be able to watch live. You can just click the little watch live button and you can uh, join us at any time or at 11 o'clock every Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So go watch some of those old ones that you've missed. There's some really cool episodes on there. And uh, as always, if you see something out in the woods you'd like us to talk about or identify or you're curious about, let us know when you might see it on a future episode of From the Woods know. Today. That's what last week was, right? It was exactly. It was a request. So, yep, no but, doubt. Uh, yes. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us again. Like we said, always uh, go to fromthewoodstoday.com. If you have any questions, email us and uh, we will see you next week at 11 o'clock. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone. From the woods today.